Well, I was about to film a video about um, putting E85 into the Hyundai Elantra. Yeah. But then this happened. It's overdue, I suppose. This is Chad, and that's been his red GSX in the background this whole time. They're both unpaid extras that we can all learn from. The front fell off. Well, some of them are built so the front doesn't fall off at all. When your next bay neighbor, whose trailer you want to borrow, decides he wants to use your tools to measure his block, you oblige. Matt's the one getting to know my dial bore gauge, and Mike's a little bit better right now, and he's my other neighbor. You've met him already, but you might not know that he has a couple of Evos and this 2004 Civic Coupe with a bone stock K-series swap in it. Congratulations on your 500 horsepower Honda. 510.3 510 on an eBay $250 turbo. That's what I'm talking about. It's an ultra budget build burning E85 that gets down. But this video is supposed to be about installing an E85 capable fuel system into your old gasoline thing. Not Chad getting to know what kind of block he'll be using for his next build. But you'll be seeing more of them. Like I said, these are my neighbors. Anywho, we're done with the other project we were working on. And I got a box full of goodies for this, including a octane sensor you see right there. Tools for working with TFE hose. Lots of fittings for the fuel tank sending unit. And hose clamps to secure things. We've got O-rings, washers anyway, lots of things that came with a PTFE hose kit from Amazon for well less than a hundred bucks. There's a, some extra parts from Racetronics for the inside of the fuel sending unit. And you see we have a couple different styles of adapters available for attaching to the octane sensor. So that sums up the parts that are needed aside from the fuel pump. And uh, that unit's about 450 liters per hour. And with all of the stuff installed, the potential for the kit will be based off of the amount of fuel you can move. So I shouldn't know this, but basically, if you have a 6 a.m. fuel system, or an 8 a.m. fuel system, or a 10 a.m. fuel system, and you know, a couple of zeros to it, that's what horsepower rating that line is capable of delivering. So 600 horsepower, 800 horsepower, 1,000 horsepower. So that's how you should select the size of the fuel line that you're going to use for your build. Figure out how many horsepower you plan to run and buy fuel lines that have the capacity, a little bit over, but the capacity to carry that amount of fuel. The car I'm doing this to is a 1992 Hyundai Elantra GLS. And uh, it's a four-door. It doesn't matter if it was this or some type of other really ridiculous exotic car. The process would be exactly the same for this conversion. In this example, it's completely irrelevant, but the basics of it are you're going to need to take your gas tank out. And for that reason, I've got a transmission jack over here, as well as a pan to catch some of the fuel that's going to inevitably leak. While I take these lines loose, which will give me the opportunity to release the front end of the tank. And I've already got the bolts out that secure it. And then we have a fuel filler neck and a vent back here that have to be taken loose. And these are all just hoses. You're going to likely find some corrosion and stuff, so bring your uh, penetrating oils and things if you feel like you're going to need those. And take good care not to damage hose fittings by using the right wrenches for all the types of things you're going to encounter. That's my best advice. I'll give you my worst advice later. Safety squint engaged. Safety squint disengaged. Do not underestimate the completely unfair advantage of using hose pliers, especially on old rubber. Always be sure to secure the line before yanking on the hose because sometimes the pliers have too much grip. Three. Nothing works better for rubber on flared tubing, though. Hose pliers. 
The filler tube and vent and the fuel pump wiring are all that's next and the whole gas tank can come out. Alright. Well, wiring harness. Oop. Oh, this ain't good. This ain't good at all. You know what? The plug port's inside the car. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It's inside the car. Underneath the back seat. This might be a lot your situation. That's funny. So, uh, ladder time. That's what time it is. Yeah, that's so unusual for it not to be a plug on the sender. Alright, got the seat bottom off. We're going to rewire that all the way up to the pump anyway. Yeah. So, now it can come down. I'm going to eat it. It's alright. So there's the fuel sending unit right there in the back. It uses bolts and I'm going to roll the table over here. I'm going to grab it in. Good times. You just get over there and get this side, I'll get this side. Okay, yours is faster. Okay, these things work pretty good. There you go. Winner! At this point, there's nothing left but three lines holding the fuel sending unit into the gas tank. I used flare wrenches on the steel fuel fittings. When you find copper, your best bet is often to just grab vice grips. All of this is subject to change here, but for those of you fortunate enough to have 5 16 inch or 3 8 inch fuel lines already, which my car does not have, we're going to demonstrate what you could do before going completely ham. It's not too bad down there. It's actually a pretty good design. Can you see that? It's got a little bucket down in the bottom. Things probably got a capacity of uh, I don't know, I'd say a little over a little over a liter, maybe yeah, around a half gallons or so, you know. So if you look down in here, there's a little tube. That's where that thing fills to keep it with the level of the rest of the tank. I don't know if that's got a spring load or a baffle or anything like that in it, but the return is gonna drain into this pan. So because the return's coming in here. It's going to constantly keep the level of this higher than the rest of the tank when the gas is low. So that's a good design. I'm actually surprised to see that it's like this. A lot of people uh, go through a lot of effort to make a little, you know, swirl tank or something inside of here. This kind of has it from the factory and that's neat for an Elantra. And here's what they need to modify. For those of you with an intake fuel pump, the sending unit is just simply a mount for the pump. Some have fuel level sensors, but mine does not. The first generation Hyundai Elantra uses a separate sensor. There's just a power wire and a ground that pass through a bulkhead, and there's only one fuel hose between the pump and the lid to worry about. Once the wires and the fuel hose are removed, the pump slides right out because it's not even the pump that was originally in here to begin with. This is a larger than stock pump, and I'm installing one that's even larger and weirder. There we go. There's the thing. You simply need to mount whatever shaped pump securely in a way where it can suck up every last bit of fuel in the tank. So I would imagine you just have to cut it really low on here, just look as close as you can to the bottom. I could do that uh, easy way. There you go. And then hose clamp it. I mean, couldn't get any easier than that. We'll see where it lines up in the bottom of the tank. The best way to do that is likely to measure it. The scientific method often requires additional unnecessary experimentation to arrive upon a conclusion based on observable and repeatable results. You thought I was going to say something else. I'm going to pull back a little bit. Yeah, I need to cut more off. Yeah, well, we're doing that right here, too. You don't really have to measure anything, but we totally did. Both sides of the hole, considering pump angle and everything, trimming and retrimming, and concluding that our measurements were good enough to set the fuel tank aside and then assemble the sending unit, starting with the pump. Worm gear technology. According to our scientific methoding, this should fit perfectly. But how can anyone really know? More scientific methodification. You know what I could do? 
I could loosen this clamp up, pull it out a little bit, push it down in there, and let it set its depth, and then push it up another half inch. And that would ensure that I can burn all the gas in the tank into my... I think you're pretty close, but you can I think I am. I think I am too. It's a good, it's a good method to testing. So you see that? I'll just snug this down a little bit so it uh, can still move, but it's stiff. And install this in the orientation it goes in, which would be like that. Press it down until it's fully seated. And carefully remove it so that you don't adjust its position. There you go. That's where it says to be. Now we don't want it pressing right up against the bottom of the tank. You, know, you see it's got about an eighth of an inch there. So we're going to slide that up a bit and then lock it down. Yeah, so we'll, we'll try to loosen that up. I'm going to get it on the pump first. Sure. That's we cut it pretty good, best I can tell you. I got a little bit ahead of myself there. Maybe put the rest of it together first? What I didn't realize until the edits is the talent that I'm witnessing right here. This thing, this is just called a fuel tube. Often included in the fuel pump kit, but also available in the DIY section of your favorite fuel shops, you'll find this nice simple means of connecting your fuel pump to the rest of your fuel system. I saved you the time and trouble of watching me destroy two of these things later in this video, but Matt made this look easy. My best advice with a fuel tube is to never heat it up while it's partially on the barb. If you fail to get it all the way down on your first attempt, then pull it back off the barb before you heat it up again. It's fairly rigid until you heat it up, but fits just fine with the help of a heat gun, and it makes a great all fuel safe high pressure seal between the pump and the sending unit. Based on my later experience of how hard these things are to put on, I wouldn't be surprised if you could hold all the fuel pressure without the clamps, but this would be a stupid thing to have to come back in here again for. There's two wires protruding from the sending unit, but only one terminal lug on the inside, and that's because the entire fuel sending unit is the other lug. It's the ground lug. There's already a screw here for it. Poof, hose clamp. And what I did here would be great for most people. Basically put, you just have a pump, it's connected to the top half of the fuel sending unit where the factory line would connect to everything stock and you'd be just fine if this were a performance car. And I say that because my car only made 80 wheel horsepower. So anyway, what we wound up with, I'll just get straight to the point. All right, and this is the return line. Oh, quarter inch in her diameter. Hmm, dang it, this fuel sending line is also the same sort of thing, it's quarter inch diameter. So just to give you an idea, the hose we're going to use is 3 8 inch in her diameter. And you can imagine that there's a drastic difference in fuel flow between quarter inch and this. Pretty drastic difference. So as convenient as it was just to have everything plugged right in and fit like factory, you know, in my case, it has to be a little different. All of this is going to go away. Because of the slight inconvenience, I have to do something that most of you probably won't. I'm going to use two kits. So, there we go. Fortunately, I get a couple extra of those. That was a nice thing to have in the package. And you'll see here, it comes with two of each kind of fitting. Except for one very important one. Two very important ones. And that would be these. This is the piece that will allow you to plug and play your octane sensor. If I snap this on there, that'll grab on and, well, you'll see it. Well, why not? So, yeah. If you want to take this off, you squeeze the things. Now it's on there. If you want to remove that, now you got to use a pick. Or just leave it on there. So eventually you amass a pretty good pile of things. Just be aware that this particular kit, should you get it, doesn't come with some things like a 6AN barb fitting. It doesn't come with a bulkhead adapter. You'll need to buy that separately. And those bulkhead adapters don't come with Teflon washers, which is why you'll have to also buy those separately. 
So all this has got to come right back loose again. Because both the send and the return lines are equivalent to 4AN, I'm replacing both of them with 6AN E85 safe hardware to match the rest of the fuel system. It's easy enough just to modify the existing fuel pressure sending unit with a few simple tools so that you can install both of the bulkhead fittings through it. To make room for the bulkheads, we need to cut off both the factory lines first, which are welded to the lid, and then make the holes bigger. For this, I'm just going to use a cutoff wheel. I'm being fairly careful because this isn't an easy part to find anymore in a junkyard if I screw it up, and I'd rather not have to make another one from scratch. To remove the other side of the fitting, I'm just relying on the inside of the tubing to center the step drill bit for me, and I'm only removing enough materials so that I can break the line off once I'm far enough through it. Then I'll recheck how far I have to take the hole. Of course, this isn't the safest way to drill this out. I'm only doing it like this because my bench vise is about 1,650 feet away from me right now, and I forgot my clamp. You should have anything you're drilling through with a step drill clamped down tightly or into something because it likes to get away from you if the bit snags your part, and it will. It's just, it's a thing they do. Be careful. I carefuled and everything turned out fine. I used a round file to clean up the rough edges around the hole. When you install the bulkhead fitting, it's not going to be airtight unless you use washers or o-rings. I use Teflon washers because they don't dry rot from ethanol. Of course, the bottom of the bulkhead isn't something that I can put the fuel tube on without adding a barbed fitting first, and I will, but I've still got the stock return line on here that needs all of the same exact treatment. Only difference is that the hole is considerably offset. They don't call it a bulkhead fitting for nothing, because it's going to interfere with the gas tank if I installed it right where the return comes through. I actually have to move it over about 3 sixteenths of an inch so that it doesn't. So after getting my bearing straight, checking which way the barb needs to point, I cut off the return tubing and used the drill press with the step drill bit because there's just no way I'll be able to move an existing hole with just a hand drill and no clamp. Okay, so I massaged the hole with a what? blunt. I uh, used a variety of different tools to make some really good holes. I'm very proud of the second one I did more so than the first because it's just an absolute perfect fit, but um, you just need to put these washers in place, screw a nut down, make sure it doesn't interfere with the gasket or the fuel sending unit, which fortunately right there looks like I'll be able to pull this off. This is one of the biggest hurdles really. Glad to have that one cleared. So like I said, I just sandwiched both bulkhead fittings with Teflon washers and tightened the nuts down. E85 safe. What exactly does E85 safe mean? A law was passed in the United States to ensure that all vehicles manufactured after 1994 could safely burn fuel containing ethanol. This was a materials issue for the manufacturers because many of the fuel lines and seals they used would rapidly degrade and cause component failures. Many injectors aren't even compatible with it. While many rubber and metal parts could be replaced with more ethanol resistant materials, pretty much every kind of rubber will still degrade over time because ethanol dry rots pretty much all of it. It all depends on how much ethanol is in the fuel mixture and of course the other factor is time. I'm not installing rubber parts that I keep having to come back in here and replace because of my fuel type. I'm making a fuel system that lets me pump and burn anything that I can tune for. Steel, Teflon, and anodized aluminum are all fine choices for this. So while my car deals with all the side effects of turning into an alcoholic, my fuel system will be immune to it. It's going to stay healthy and become its favorite enabler. But it doesn't end with just the fuel sending unit for me, and that's unfortunate. Take a minute and just marvel at this spectacular fit that I did. I made it fit the factory brackets that run the whole length of the car. A hard line all the way to the fuel filter. Tucked and fit behind the axle. You can't even see the fuel filter, but one piece line all the way to the back of the gas tank, which because it's aluminum now has to come out. That's the wrong material for running E85. Alcohol is very corrosive and aluminum isn't going to hold up to this. It probably worked for a short period of time, but as corrosion builds, you don't want anything that's feeding your injectors. And I can't even use it for a return. But that's too bad. It's got to go. There's some stuff you just shouldn't use with E85. There's nothing wrong with steel factory lines if they can deliver the fuel volume that your tune requires, but aluminum is out of the question if it's not anodized, and the factory rubber hoses aren't going to cut it either. Even where it comes to traditional AN hoses, they're lined with rubber. 
Viton is not nitrile, is not EPMD, is not NBR, and while you could split hairs over the formulation and compatibility with E85, none of them do it particularly well over time. Teflon, better known as PTFE fuel hose, can do every kind of fuel. If you just want a 6AN PTFE steel and nylon braided hose from the tank to the engine, it only takes about 100 bucks to do it as a kit. If your fuel fittings need O-rings, we'll make them Teflon because rubber will dry rot and eventually leak. But since the rest of my AN hoses are an unknown rubber and my factory lines wherever I've maintained them are only a quarter inch in inner diameter, I've got all my work cut out for me. Miss you, buddy. I get to replace everything except the fuel filter regulator and rail. It looks like I went ahead and started and made some hoses without you, but I didn't. These are the old hoses off my Elantra. One of them went to the fuel filter and the other one went to the regulator from the rail. And these also are regular AN hoses. And they look very much like the same line that we're using, right? I mean, it's nylon braided hose, correct? They're actually very different. These are the ones that have the rubber lining inside of them. I can take one of them apart and show it to you. Uh, but really, you'll be able to identify these from the outside. The fittings right here. You might notice that there is no lip. It just seems to be kind of, it tapers down kind of smooth and parallel with the hose. On fittings for PTFE, you can see there's a tapered edge that goes all the way around the bottom and it's very different from the shape of that. These are for the Teflon hose. The insides of them are different the way they connect and I can go ahead and take it apart here. Never mind this thing, none of you are going to have one of these and that's alright. Not necessary, you can do this with a couple of wrenches but this allows me to work quickly and keep from damaging fittings. And the reason why is because you can get this perfectly parallel so that you can't accidentally hit the AN fitting with the wrench. When you do it right, it doesn't look like this. You can see here I nicked the edge right there with the wrench. These fittings are completely reusable. All you'd have to do is jam this thing into a new piece of hose with this piece on it and screw it back down and send her for another round. When you look on the inside of the hose, pretty obvious it's rubber. There's a pretty big difference between the two of these. The rubber will degrade with contact with alcohols. Alcohol will dry rot it. High content alcohol fuels will actually impregnate the rubber and begin sweating through the rubber hose. It makes some kind of rubber soft. It makes some kind of rubber hard. I have a demonstration here of the wrong kind of hose that was used with the 85. This came in in a truck, but this is some all-purpose fuel coolant uh, air kind of hose rated for 300 PSI. And it's supposed to be real soft and pliable, but it's, it's hard as a rock and it's supposed to be something that would mash that with my thumb. Yeah, here's a piece of rubber that's like it, and that's how that's supposed to work. Even steel braided hose is easier to bend than that hose is. So, rock solid. And yes, this actually was used as somebody's fuel line. If you uh, buy a a hose for use inside the fuel tank, make sure it's submersible, and still even all of those may not work very well. These are some fittings here. Now this is what I was telling you that you shouldn't have any parts in your fuel system that aren't anodized. The inside of this looks just fine, but the inside of this one had bare aluminum. And you see that white crusting and caking of oxidation that occurred? That's all from alcohol or contact with ethanol. So. If you look here, this end of the fitting was just cast aluminum and it's all crusty and that stuff goes downstream and it gets into your injectors. You may not be able to see that very well. This one's pretty well caked. Let me get the inside of, there you go. That's what it should look like. That's a clean one right there. It has some overspray paint on it, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what the inside of it should look like. Not all crusty and caked on like that. I hope the camera is in focus for at least some of that. But we're going to make two hoses to replace the ones that I just took out. 
because we can't use this rubber hose and working with PTFE is fairly straightforward. It's actually a really easy material to work with. Just straighten that line out a little bit. Find how long of a piece I need to make. Grab some tape, wrap some tape around it. Two layers is enough. When you cut this, don't apply any pressure. That's absolutely terrible. I may do that again. If you cut it well, you wouldn't have to do this. Take a little pick or something, or a flat bladed screw, a small screwdriver, or something that's kind of rigid. And you want to go around the outside and kind of spread this open just a little bit. It's easier when it's not taped. Grab yourself a fitting, and there's a ferrule in here, a little aluminum one, and this would crush down onto the pipe. Put this fitting onto the line first before you do all of this because you're going to need it. Install the ferrule, push it all the way down on the pipe so the pipe seats flush all the way around the edge. With that piece in place, give it a couple taps for good luck and shove this thing in there. This cleans up the edges and it scores the inside of the Teflon tubing presses that plastic into the edge of the aluminum where it's got a couple of ribs on it and it scores itself into place. Then all you need to do is fully insert this all the way so that it's flush against the ferrule. Ferrule. Tighten that thing down. I don't like that. It doesn't line up exactly where I want it, so. There you have it, one end done. There's a 45 on the other end. So one more time again, you have the ferrule, you have the collar. Put this thing on here. It's easier when it's taped. You just run the pick around it, spread it out enough to get the ferrule on it. Get it flush all the way around the edge. Jam it to roll the inner edge and to seat it into the ferrule. Fitting, collar, one down. I'm struggling with my angle grinder because somebody used it and set it up for a lefty, but I'm a righty. Much better when your guard isn't on backwards. I feel like we've covered enough about this hose that we can speed all this up now. Like I said, PTFE hose is really easy to work with and safe with every automotive fuel. Most of the assembly tools and the fittings that you need are included in the kits, but if they aren't, you've seen them working here and know what to look for in order before you do this. You can use a bench vise or a couple of AN wrenches to avoid this big fancy fitting tool that I'm not even using correctly, but it's all rinse repeat from here, save for cleaning out all of your finished pieces with compressed air. You'll get bits of nylon, teflon, and steel from cutting them inside the hose. So blow out not only the hose, but the fittings themselves relentlessly. You don't want that stuff in your fuel filter or injectors. I put a straight fitting on a hose to attach to the fuel filter and ran it the length of the car to the gas tank. This is my fuel send line. I won't be able to trim it to length until I reinstall the gas tank, but we've still got some work to do before I get there. I'd like to use the factory fuel line clips somehow, if at all possible. It doesn't look like I'll be able to get them both in here, but I'll try. Most of you with goals under 500 horsepower will probably be able to use your factory fuel send line as your new return line. I can't do that because I already deleted the factory steel line in it years ago in favor of the aluminum line that we just removed, but it wouldn't have made any difference anyway had I not because everything on my car was still a quarter inch inner diameter. So my factory return goes away. I cut it in half to make removing it from the engine bay side a lot easier because it bends and routes around all kinds of things up there. I just used my angle grinder to remove the stays that were too small for the line. But even with removing that, both lines still aren't going to fit in here together. I guess I'll clean up all this with zip ties later.
Now to remove the front half of the fuel return line. When I did this before, I ran the hard line all the way to the regulator. I also didn't have a lift. I did all this on a concrete floor. This is so much better. Now for the return, because we had to cut the return line off, you can chalk this up to uh, the scientific method. We peeled one of these hoses, squished up the steel braiding and pulled it off. And since this is the return, it's a no pressure line essentially because it's open on the bottom end. We just used a straight fitting and compress that thing on there and I'm able to make a fuel return. It just spits out all the way low into the tank so that we don't froth it up and make a bunch of air bubbles. So that's, I think that's gonna work out great. We just need a electrical bulkhead to connect a 10 gauge line and I gotta figure out how to get that thing out of there. The factory electrical bulkhead on this car appears to just be a bunch of silicone injected into a paper-like surround to help it keep its shape while it dried during manufacturing. I don't need to be kind to any of this because I'm replacing all of it with something different. This is my own personal preference because everything upstream electrically is now a big long single piece of 10 gauge wire connected to the battery through a 30 amp relay. The process for me is not much different from what we just did with both of the fuel bulkhead fittings. I just have to drill the right sized hole to make the electrical bulkhead that I bought fit in it. The part I bought is sold by Racetronics. It goes together with a cap screw and two Delrin bushings four o-rings and a couple of lock nuts and washers. It's designed for a four millimeter depth and I've only got half of that to work with here. But it's Delrin. I can cut it. Here's another look at it. It goes together oriented like this. When you cut this hole, don't rely on the step drill to do the final hole. Use a round file or a die grinder to sneak up on it just to the point where it almost fits and then stop. The tighter this fits, the less chance you're going to have of creating a fuel leak. Even though there's o-rings all around, the tight fit with the cap screw will crush the Delrin into the lid once it's tight to make it seal even better. To cut the Delrin bushing, I just removed the o-ring so that it protruded through the hole a little bit, pressed it tightly against the lid, and cut off the excess with the razor blade. That helped me use the lid as a guide to make one smooth, straight cut. Now with those two extra millimeters removed, the bulkhead can be attached to the lid. I have chosen not to disassemble my fuel pump to replace the factory 14 gauge wires on it with 10 gauge, but I have opted to splice a section of 10 gauge TXL wire with a ring terminal on it since I have to extend these wires anyway. This is a used pump, so the plastic will be more brittle. Add to that, the pump was originally designed with wiring that matches its electrical demand on the circuit. All the 10 gauge does is ensure the power that it can pull is always available. If I had two or multiple fuel pumps in here, the same thing applies. The power for all the pumps would still be always available. There's my logic in doing this. It's not a matter of when on this car, it's if. It actually does make my work here more serviceable in the future if I should ever have to do any of this again. The fuel pump power and ground are now attached to the sending unit. Now I have to just install the new fuel return line we made for inside the tank, put the gasket back on it, and we're done with it. That's weird, because you never saw me put the fuel tube back on it. There's a reason for that. I'm not as good as that as Matt is. I needed every sort of training wheel necessary to get the pump to fit the AN barb, and it protruded so far out that I even had to shrink it. More about that. I fought this fuel tube so hard. It's very easy to go a little too far and cause the post to collapse on itself or twist and melt or just break right off, really. Uh, my advice is if you're going to use this kind of thing, don't just buy the one. Buy extras and buy a few different lengths because you don't really know exactly how it's going to fit inside your tank. I managed to really shrink this fuel tube. I trimmed it, as you can see, about a half inch on each side. And I used, I will tell you and be honest, drill bits were involved. I used the drill bit to keep everything straight had this pressing down on it and used a heat gun to shrink all this stuff as much as I could because I didn't want to do the big tube and the loop thing. So eventually I ended up with this and I'm really happy with the results. Fits all the way down in there when you compress it and when it, we use the hose clamp to clamp it in, it'll keep all that right in place exactly where I need it. Nice solid fit. I figured I'd go back and explain that one. I suck at it, but even I could do it. 
The sending unit is finished, but I'm not installing it in the tank yet because I still need to run, cut, and trim a fuel return line as well. The fuel return is only slightly more complicated than the send line because it has an electrical thing in it. I called this thing an octane sensor, and that's not really what it is. It's actually a content sensor. It's capable of measuring the amount of ethanol that's in your fuel. So basically it's a capacitive device that sends a signal through this thing and it reads the frequency and sends that back to the ECU and your ECU is able to determine how much ethanol there is. There are two different tables in ECM link. You have a min octane and a max octane. I called this an octane sensor because essentially that's the trickery that it uses in order to be able to keep the fuel correct without me having to get a laptop and retune my car every single time I change fuels or don't have a pure mixture. This is going to add flex fuel capability to a car that otherwise wouldn't have it, but because my ECU supports it, it's going to be fairly straightforward. I still have to wire it. And I already bought the pigtail for this thing, and basically this will just plug right in when I'm done. I have to run a power and a ground and one of them back to the ECU. We'll get there. But in order to install that content sensor, I have to uh, put these guys in line with some of the PTFE hose. And I've got another bundle of hose, but really if I were smart, I'd be using some excess off the line that's already on the Hyundai. I still have to take that off and blow it out when we're done. But let's look at where this is going to get installed. There's my fuel filter right there. And right along next to it, on this side, I want to bring the fuel return up. And I'm going to put a 90 degree elbow right here to go to the content sensor. Coming out of the content sensor, I'm going to put a 90 to the fuel regulator. This is the return side, so I'm not really too concerned about putting restrictions in that. Originally, I wanted to mount it right here between these clips. But no, this foam padding for the firewall here would have to be cut. And that would be great and all, because it's a great place to fit it if those clips would do anything at all to hold and mount the uh, fittings or the lines or any of that stuff, but it doesn't. It doesn't fit. They're too close together. But if I want to use a 90 degree fitting here for the turn that I'm going to zip tie or attach right here so that the fuel return can run parallel to the send line, then uh, I'm going to actually have to assemble this with a small section of hose. I'm going to snap that fitting on as an example just to show you that's uh, about how far it's going to sit out. And I'm going to have probably about almost an inch of hose between the two of these. And so that's about where it's going to want to sit. Right about there. If I move it over a little bit more, that's about three inches of hose and maybe I can benefit from using this thing to zip tie some stuff. I don't know. We'll see how it works. The only thing you need to be careful with when installing this hose is not to put it in a place where anything's going to rub against it and route it away from heat sources. Don't let anything dangle below the car. The old hard lines were great protection for a fuel system, but this PTFE hose is still wrapped in stainless steel and nylon for its protection. That steel braid around the Teflon is what gives this hose its high pressure rating. But abrasion with the braided nylon or steel will eventually cause either the hose or the thing that it's rubbing against to fail, depending on whatever material it is. Braids can act like a saw, so take precautions to secure everything however you can avoid that. I made it a little bit longer than I really wanted to, but I found a really good way that it fits in a place where I'm not going to have to trim a whole bunch of the foam. So I know it's a little strange, but I'm going to add a union to one side. This is flexible hose and you could have run a one piece all the way back to the tank, but I'm going to make it uh, have a union here so that I can make a very tight turn and follow the contours of the fuel send line all the way back to the tank just to help tidy up a little bit and I don't mind having this 90 degree bend on uh, on the return line. You also want to use the content sensor on the return line as well just because it's kind of a pointless thing to have to put a restriction like this in line with your fuel send. The octane it's measuring is going to be what's immediately coming off the rail and it'll do the same thing so you know take that restriction out put this on the return with all your other restrictions in 90s. I'll expand a little bit on the restriction portion of where you need to put things and why it matters. Your electronic fuel injected car has a base fuel pressure. You typically set it without the plenum vacuum line attached. 
But once that vacuum line is reconnected and after it's set, the vacuum at idle will actually drop you below your base fuel pressure. It needs to under vacuum. Fuel pressure increases with boost. It drops under vacuum. Restrictions in the return line will actually take some of the work off your regulator in order to achieve your base fuel pressure at the rail. What it might not let you do if there's too much of it is reach the proper fuel pressure that you need under vacuum. Instead of finding this out later, this is why I replaced the return line with 6AN fittings and lines even though it's complete overkill for my goals. Restrictions from the tightly bent fittings or the content sensor matter less here. They won't restrict flow to the injectors, provided that the line size is adequate enough to carry the fuel back to the tank. Instead, they'll just help you achieve your base fuel pressure a little easier. The reason you wouldn't put the content sensor in the send line is because you can't see straight through it. There's a restriction. That will cause turbulence and in turn, it'll cap the maximum amount of fuel that you can flow to the injectors through your line. That's going to limit the power potential of your fuel system. You want the send line, the fuel filter, and the fuel rail fittings to be as unrestricted as possible in order to achieve its maximum power output. Everything you've seen me doing here is how you do that. Don't take my word for it. Even the people who made your flex fuel capable ECU said to do it this way. Put the ethanol sensor on your return line. Now I'm making the line that goes between the return on the tank and the union fitting at the ethanol sensor. I wound up actually routing the fuel return on the outside of the send, halfway because it was a better fit in the engine bay, but luckily because the return line is actually on the outside fitting at the sending unit. So I didn't have to cross one line over the other anywhere past this. I'm not actually good at this on purpose, sometimes it's an accident. But it did leave me having to put the return instead of the send line inside those fuel line clips. I just zip tied the send to the return line all the way down underside the car and tossed the hoses up over the rear dead axle to make getting the lengths of both of these hoses correct. Fitting my work on the car is always my favorite thing to do. Whenever you're making your own parts, there's a potential to not only make a better fit, but also a fine line between either creating or mitigating waste. You should never trust the fit unless everything is bolted into place. The hose will find its easiest route between these points, and you don't want it to get pinched or end up too short on the final install. With the gas tank in place, it's easy to see where you need to cut the line and install your fittings for the tank. All I did was wrangle some tape up in here to mark where I need to cut the lines, and then take all the stuff right back out of here to do it. Keep your gas tank covered and away from where you're working when it's not installed. Don't cut lines with your gas tank anywhere near it. Teflon hose has steel braids that throw sparks. Sparks are hotter than flames, and don't ever stop using your head when you're messing with fuel parts. There's only two lines left that I have to terminate with hose ends before all of the components that I had to make are complete. Going to plaid here. All you need to know is that I used 45 degree fittings here. My power goals are below 600 horses, so this really doesn't matter. Before you complete your fuel system, blow out the whole fuel system with compressed air. Be sure to exclude your fuel filter and your fuel rail from this equation. You don't want to blow air into either one of those because, well, because it's stuff. You're trying to blow stuff out. I wrapped the fuel line with a shop rag so that I could show you my mixture of nylon, teflon, and steel bits from cutting the hose. That's why it's gray, and nothing we cut was gray. All of it is still in there, no matter how careful you are. Don't feed that stuff to your injectors. Now for some dramatic colorization for the removal of my fuel tank send and return intermediary lines. These go away completely as I'm just running the lines all the way to the bulkhead fittings. And it's time to install the new unit. I made sure everything was clean and tight first. It's held in by six bolts that I tightened in a star pattern. Should probably have replaced the gasket, but I didn't. And of course, put the lock nut for the pump power wire back on it so I don't lose it. So that's how all my work looks like from the outside. I need a ground lug and it's only natural to make a ground where that attaches right to one of the bolts on the lid. You want that clean, so that's what I was doing with a flap wheel there. The only other thing I need to be concerned with is wire management, so I transferred the grommet that goes through the pan under the back seat to the new ground wire. That's great for the ground side. Now I just need to finish the fuel pump power wire that I ran back here in the performance subwoofer installation video. I have to get that out of the inside of the car and pass it through the body. It's going through that grommet too. All I'm doing is removing the crimp job that I hated in that video with the extra length of wire, crimping on a new ring terminal for the wire I pulled, and attached it to the electrical bulkhead connector I just installed on the fuel sending unit. Take extra care to insulate your electrical connections because you really don't need to make a fire right on top of your gas tank. 
I choose three or four layers of adhesive shrink tubing as my insulator should be plenty. So now I just have to sort out the ground location inside the car for the fuel pump, straighten out my grommets, put my back seat back together, secure all the lines, tighten all my fittings again, and the entire mechanical aspect of this job is complete. A corrosion proof fuel system capable of delivering five to six hundred horsepower worth of fuel, depending on what kind of fuel it is. In my case, it's just going to be corn juice whenever it feels right. E85 costs a good bit less than gasoline does where I live, but it's not available everywhere. If your car can burn it safely, it comes with a lot of benefits regarding its volatility and the speed of its flame front that make it a delightful experience in a force inducted car. Yes, that does mean it's going to make more horsepower. It's going to make more boost too. What stops most people from doing it is having to retune their car for it because its air fuel ratio is very different. Not all cars can do this. It takes more ethanol in order for your car to run right. This is why my installation has added hardware installed. To adapt itself from one pure fuel type to the next one automatically or for any fuel mixture in between. It's how you do this or how your modern flex fuel equipped and capable car already works. Two separate VE and two separate timing tables. This video is for all the cars that came without that capability or perhaps even a poor implementation of it. Someone in the comments will tell us that this is a poor implementation of it. I don't know man, I just work here. This is my example. Everything's tight. Now I just have to check for leaks. I ran it over a minute. Heard nothing splashing. Smelled no gasoline. Saw no puddles. Felt nothing wet. So there's nothing to taste. It's all sealed up. What's weird is my fuel pressure didn't change at all. The regulator stayed right where it was with the old pump and lines. But I did remember that the fuel tank filler hose and vent still need to go back on. Ah, uh, whoops. Just to prove the fuel system's complete, let's take it for a test drive. See? It works. It's not just movie magic. It runs and drives. Good enough for gasoline anyway. But let's install that ethanol content sensor, shall we? According to this laptop, the mass airflow sensor is pin 2 on the mass airflow sensor connector. That would be pin two on the MAF connector. I don't have a MAF connector. So that pin should be empty according to this laptop. According to this laptop, pin 10 is the airflow sensor input. This is a diagram of my actual harness that I made. And it looks to me like its neighbors are going to be red and blue, ABS control, I don't have that. Looks like uh, it'll be next to pin number 12, which is the ignition timing adjustment connector, yellow wire with a red stripe. It's supposed to be a green wire with a blue stripe, but I don't have it. And uh, let's see what's its other neighbors. We got a green and a yellow over there. Knock sensor, the white wire right there, number nine. So should be pretty easy to find on the connector. I've got everything pulled out. And here's the pigtail for the sensor I'm about to wire. I mean, it's already color coded. There would be the signal. We got a ground. We got a power. I'm going to run this red and orange wire for the power. I'm going to run this uh, gray and black striped wire for the signal. So that's going to go to pin 10. And this is going to come from the 12 volt ECU power somewhere else on the harness. I'll show you in a minute. But this ground wire, I'm actually able to bolt this down to a chassis ground right next to it, and that's convenient. So all I'm going to do is prep this for uh, installation with the ring terminal. The ground connection is really easy, and you're supposed to always use a chassis ground for the sensor. For the power and signal wires, I'm going to extend those, add loom, and pull it through the firewall to make the other two connections inside the car. Normally I would crimp these. But because this came with solder, it seemed to imply they want me to solder it, and that's fine by me. Why not both? I'll crimp the other ends of these wires. We'll compromise. Yay! Notice what I'm doing here. Heat the wire and flow the solder to it. It's different for electrical components because you can melt them if you overheat them. But for wire, that's how you make a clean solder joint. Now to protect these wires and then pull them through the firewall. 
My ECM Link ECU already supports flex fuel operation, and it's a very popular choice for engine management within the Eclipse Talon Laser Evo and just generally the DSM community at large. This car is a classic example that not everything with a 4G63 in it is a DSM, and Mitsubishi never put a collection of parts anything like mine together and sold it as a whole car. This is not a DSM at all, but the ECU pins would be exactly the same for the first generation ones. But most of you have watched me make my own engine harness for this thing that excludes many of the factory connectors in favor of their GM components and counterparts for metering airflow using speed density. It's a custom job. Most of you DSM guys could just buy a cable that plugs into your mass airflow connector and easily do all the exact same things as the quote unquote hard way that you're going to watch me do here. I think that it's really easy to do this either way, but that's probably because I made the engine harness and have every spare part I needed to do this already. So, yeah, it's like cheating for me. Sure enough, looks like that's the connector we need right there. And oriented in the ECU, it goes that way. If you count across the top from left to right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's an empty slot. So. Good news is, is the pin I need to do this with is already available and I happen to have a spare ECU pin right here along with all that cable that just came through the firewall. All I have to do is route this around and attach it, hook this red one up to 12 volt power and the gray one terminated into pin 10 and I'm ready to rock and roll. With ECM Link, you have to already be using speed density airflow metering in order to connect an ethanol content sensor at all. Otherwise, the ECU pen that can read the ethanol sensor is in use doing something different, something else that you need. So for everyone else that doesn't have an ECU capable of supporting two VE tables and two timing curves like ECM Link can, or that can read an ethanol content sensor in general, well, then you're going to need to obtain a tuning solution that supports an ethanol content sensor at the very minimum. Just whatever you do, don't ground your sensor to the ECU harness's ground. Use a chassis ground. I didn't connect power up close to the ECU pin because you don't really want to make connections to your engine harness like that. The ends of the harness receive the most tension and stress typically, and we already saw what that can create. I had an accessory connector for my boost control solenoid that goes to the same 12 volt power supply pin on the ECU because this wire is on its own separate leg of that circuit. It just felt like the smart way for me to do this. Plus it gave me a whole lot more room to work. I'm not going to put the dash fully back together until I know that everything works, but I still have some other prerequisites to fulfill first. I have to upgrade my ECU's firmware. The functionality of the ethanol sensor with ECM Link requires the most current release of ECM Link version 3. There's a five step process for this, linked in the description for those of you who don't find anything about ethanol in your AUX Maps tab. And that's the symptom that you'll have if the firmware or the software is out of date. If the software isn't as current as the firmware, you either won't be able to connect or the AUX Maps tab won't even show up at all when you do. Seriously, why wouldn't you want your software and firmware versions to match? Just remember to upgrade the software in your tuning device first to make sure it can run the latest software prior to flashing new firmware into your ECU, because any version of the software can flash new firmware into your ECU. Do it in that order, device first, ECU second. It's kind of like checking to see if you can get your fill plug loose before draining your transmission. If you did everything right, you connect, click the live ECU config settings, and then you find your AUX Maps tab, that's where you should find the ethanol controls. You can enable the sensor, you can set thresholds for when to shift between the min octane and max octane tables based on your ethanol content percentages that the sensor is reading for fuels that you have in your area. So it can accurately interpolate any fuel mixture in between those fuels. And it can do this for you so you don't have to do math or anything special at the pump. No connecting a laptop, idiot proof until you drive somewhere with better fuel than you normally get. There's even a global percentage you can trim in case you encounter pure ethanol and your injectors are unable to keep up. It'll never run better than if you dyno tune both fuels and you should subscribe for that one. But the default settings are going to get you up and running. All we need to do from here is tell the ECU to add the captured flex fuel values to its routines so that it knows it's now a flex fuel sensor instead of a mass airflow sensor. There are reasons you might want to adjust the thresholds on this tab, but like I said, this will get you started. Next, we need to display the values so that you can see that the sensor is working. 
I'm starting a log because there's nowhere to currently display the values. I'm adding just the flex values to the log window, and there you go, bottom row. The flex ethanol mix value is the one that interpolates between your min and max tables. It's the percentage of alcohol that it's detecting in your fuel. Frequency is the raw hertz value, the sensor's reading. Flex adjust is the amount of pulse width adjustment being applied based on ethanol content in the fuel. And flex weight is not the gravity of your fuel, it's where you're at regarding interpolation between your min and max octane tables. 0% is min octane and 100% is max octane. It's the weight between the min and max tables. The values it's populated with appear sane for the gas that's being pumped in my region. I'm going to turn the fuel pump on now so that you can see at least something change. I've just got premium pump gas in here at the moment that I've always run, so it should be a fairly homologous mixture, but let's try it. You can see the flex mix value flutter a tiny bit with the pump running. This is telling me that I wired my sensor correctly. Never mind me toggling the old throttle pedal there. I'm just showing you the log is running because the engine's off. The lines are all straight, so it's, yeah, it's moving. The last thing that I need to do to get ready for E85 is copy my fuel and timing tables where I've been doing all my tuning from the max octane over to the min octane tables. ECM link makes this really easy. You just right click the table and copy it and then you go to the other one and you paste it. Save it to the ECU. From what I understand, the power difference will all be gained simply from the fuel type alone. I don't need to change any of this unless my car behaves differently from one fuel to the next. The ECU is already metering ethanol content so that it can calculate the different injector pulse width required based on ethanol content. The ECU is changing my fuel delivery without me having to adjust these tables. But there might be benefits from the stability of ethanol under boost to have some timing gains and peak cylinder pressure. And that's why it's good to have two tables. Sounds nerdy, but really it's very simple. All the power gains will come simply from the different fuel. And this is how I prepared my car for that change. This was the whole entire flex fuel system installation start to finish in one video. It's ready for its new future. The scientific method is in full effect. We're at the very beginning of the find out stage right now. So if you like this scientific method, please do all the things with the buttons in the comments below. But it's Patreon that brought you this stocking stuffer. Happy holidays, everybody. And until next time, stay tubed. <music>